Hello, I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and um, one of the themes that I talk about quite a bit as a Catholic classicist who's been working in classical studies uh, for 25 years now is that um, one of the sources of confusion among modern parents, especially Christian parents, especially homeschooling parents, has been brought about by a fake classical education movement that started in the 1990s um, that took advantage of the ignorant, the ignorance of parents and of the, the dissatisfaction that parents have with um, modern schools and presented an alternative uh, that would supposedly solve all the problems of modern education. And they called this classical Christian education. And they present this as a return to a system of education that was used back in the good old days before these bad modern people, whoever you want to think of the bad modern people as, um, before the bad modern people changed everything and made the modern school system, we can just go back to the good old system and restore that. And you know what that is? That's what we call classical Christian education. This, this movement has caused, you know, Christian education, the actual restoration and renewal of Christian education to be delayed by 50 years, if, if that, uh, maybe more. Because it's presented something claiming to be something that it's not, teaching a whole generation of parents and teachers and students to think that they are actually receiving something and doing something that they're not, and delaying the actual work that needs to be done of restoring real classical Christian education. Now, I've explained this um, in my book, Understanding Classical Catholic Education, which is available for free on the Academy website. I've explained this in articles, I've explained this in videos, um, and a lot of time parents and other folks like teachers who work in these other schools or people who work with or for these other programs, they'll come after me personally uh, saying that I misrepresent what these people say, that, that they don't actually claim that they're restoring real Greek and Roman education, that they don't actually claim that what they're doing is uh, the, the educational program that was, that was used in church history. They accuse me of, of making up those those claims, that they don't really say that, that they're just presenting an alternative to modern education, and they call it classical education because it's, it's some kind of return to old-fashioned stuff. Well, what I'd like to do in a few videos is actually sit together and watch a few of these videos that explain and answer the question, what is classical education? And I'd like for you to watch with me and see if, if I make these claims up or if they do in fact tell parents that if you get on board with their program, you are actually going back in time and giving your children the education that was given by wise men and Christians through history. Let's watch their videos and see if it's true that they make the claims that I say they do, or if I just make them up and pick on these poor people who are just, you know, trying to do their best. Let's walk through some videos together. We'll, we'll go through one in each video. And we'll just listen to their message and see what they have to say, and whether it's true that they make the claim that their method of education is in fact the historical method that existed in the past, or whether I just make that up. Because in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, I say very straightly, we offer the education that was offered to Christian children 
in history and in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome. We do state that explicitly. We do assert that. These folks tell me and tell others that I accuse them of saying that they do that when they don't actually say that. Well, let's take a look. Let's walk through one of these videos. This video I'm pulling up here is published by a, a school. Um, I think it's called Samuel Fuller School. I have no idea who that is. Um, you can see the video says that they're going to answer the question, what is classical Christian education? So this should be great. We're going to learn what classical Christian education really is. It's a five-minute video, nice and short. And we're just going to go through this together and see what they have to say. And as we do, I'll point out, as a Catholic classicist, I'll point out the subtle little arguments that they use to try and influence unknowing Christian parents. Um, I'll show you the arguments they use, the rhetoric that they use, as it were, and we'll see if they actually make historic claims that they are teaching what was taught and how it was taught in the past. So let's take a look. What is a classical Christian education? I think it's by Samuel Fuller School. Let's take a watch. As a parent, how do you make the difficult decision of where to send your child to school? If you're like many parents, weighing the pros and cons of each option can be overwhelming. Public, private, charter, prep, Montessori, homeschool, there are many different directions to go in. In the next four minutes, we're going to take a look at the classical Christian education model. While it's impossible to thoroughly cover any subject in one short video, we hope to at least spark your interest. Whether you're a novice to the classical model or a long-term supporter, let's get started. The classical education movement has recently seen growth in America, but the model itself is ancient, dating back two millennia to the Greek and Roman societies of Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. So, is it true that these folks don't actually claim that the model of education that they promote goes back to the Greeks and Romans? Or do they in fact say that? Let's listen to that again. The classical model or a long-term supporter? Let's get started. The classical education movement has recently seen get growth ready. in America, but the model itself is ancient, dating back two millennia to the Greek and Roman societies of Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. So this model, this model here that we're going to talk about in this video, dates back two millennia. 2,000 years, we're about to be introduced, you know, if you're a Christian parent who doesn't, who doesn't know these things, we're going to be introduced not to some alternative that Christian parents have developed and you know, that they think is better than a modern school. No, that's not what they claim. They claim that this model is 2,000 years old. This model is the model that was used in ancient Greece and Rome by people like Aristotle and Plato. Let's hear it one more time. America, but the model itself is ancient, dating back two millennia to the Greek and Roman societies of Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. In classical education, students it. are educated according to their natural developmental stage. This model of education splits students into three groups or schools called the trivium. Okay, now we just were told that this model is 2,000 years old and dates back to the time of the Greeks and Romans, to Aristotle, Plato, and, and Socrates. And this model that we're being introduced to here is presented to us as these three stages, grammar, logic and rhetoric, and we're told this model here is called the trivium. Let's, let's listen to that one more time. Education, students are educated according to their natural developmental stage. This model of education... 
Notice it said students are educated according to their natural developmental stage. Natural developmental stage. So when we talk about grammar, logic, and rhetoric, you're going to see here, and you're going to see this in all these videos, they are not talking about the art of grammar, the art of logic, and the art of rhetoric. They're talking about developmental stages of students. And they're claiming that this understanding of the natural developmental stages of children was called the trivium by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Well, my first challenge to anyone who thinks that I'm just a jerk is this. Show me in the writings of Aristotle or Plato or Socrates anywhere where grammar, logic, and rhetoric were understood to be stages of learning and were called, as stages of learning, the trivium. One of the problems with this argument, notice that the, the, the narrator says in ancient Greece and Rome, writers like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, logic didn't exist in the time of Socrates. The art of logic was discovered and taught by Aristotle. Aristotle wrote the art of rhetoric. Plato never wrote the art of rhetoric. Plato didn't know the art of rhetoric. Plato didn't even know the art of logic. They still weren't developed or discovered. Aristotle is the one who did that. Aristotle established the art of logic. That's what his organon is. It's the first ever explanation of the art of reasoning. So it's not true that this system was ever used by Plato and Socrates because the arts of logic and rhetoric didn't even exist. They're simply taking these three words that come from medieval, or we could say classical education, and they're using them to rebrand or rename what already exists in modern education. In modern education, we have elementary school, middle school, and high school. All that these people are doing is they're saying, hey, you know what? We're going to give these things some clever new names. We're going to go back into history and find some, some words that were used in history and we're going to rebrand elementary, middle school, and high school. We're going to call elementary from now on grammar. We're going to call middle school logic. And we're going to call high school rhetoric. And doesn't that give a feel that, that this is something different? This is something, this is something old or, or historical? Grammar, logic, rhetoric not elementary, middle, and high school, not, none of this modern stuff. This is ancient grammar, logic, rhetoric. They're just renaming the three parts of the modern educational system. This is the same tactic that Starbucks used when to try and stir up some interest in a boring coffee shop. What did they do? They chose to rename the sizes of the drinks. So that instead of saying small, medium, and large, they rebranded it so that a small is called tall. And what are the other ones? Uh, venti and whatever they, grande and venti, right? Tall, grande, and venti. So we walk into Starbucks and we don't ask for a small coffee. You know, this isn't Dunkin' Donuts. This is Starbucks. We don't ask for a small coffee. We ask for a tall, you know, Sumatra or whatever the flavor of the day is. Give me a venti latte. And we rename something so simple as the sizes of the drinks to try and create some sense that something is different. Oh, and then we double the quantity of coffee used. It's just a cheap, you know, rebranding... Um, 
marketing strategy that gives people the same stuff but justifies charging double the price and having them actually imagine that they're getting something different because the name of the size of the drink is different. This is all that we're doing here. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Now all the homeschool moms can start walking around talking about grammar, logic, and rhetoric and not use elementary school, middle school, and high school anymore. This is just marketing. It's just rebranding. But what's, what's you know, evil about it is that you saw that they claim explicitly that what they're presenting here to homeschool mom is that this is what the ancient Greeks and Romans actually thought about education and actually did. Therefore, you as a parent, if you receive this, you can now move forward with the education of your child and trust that you're giving your child what is timeless and trustworthy. You're giving your children not some, not some modern education, not some you know, crazy opinion or theory about education, but you can trust as a parent that you are giving your ch uh, children an education that is proven. You can trust. And here's the big part. You can invest. If you know that this is the real thing, if you know that this is the education that was enjoyed by the ancient Greeks and Romans and by Christians all throughout history before, before you know, the modern bad people changed things, if you know that this is the real education, you can pull out that credit card, pull out that checkbook, and you can invest because this is timeless and trustworthy. That's what's evil about this message. It's just marketing. Starbucks is cute and clever. This is not cute. This is misleading and historically false, as we're going to continue to see. Let's go through this again. And as I play this, notice that when they get into the, the names of the three stages, they link them to age levels or grade levels, which obviously is not ancient. There was no such thing as K-12 education before the 1850s when America invented it. And, but this is how crazy this explanation gets. Let's watch. In medical education, students are educated according to their natural developmental stage. This model of education splits students into three groups or schools called the trivium. The trivium has been compared to constructing a building. In the grammar school, between kindergarten and about sixth grade, we are building that? the foundation. We are teaching children the facts about how the world works. Notice here one other thing. When we talk about grammar and we, we, we say that it's a, it's a stage of learning, we say that it's like kindergarten to fifth grade-ish kids. Um, notice that we're not talking, this video isn't talking about language. It's not talking about grammar as the art of, of reading and speaking rightly, which is what grammar is. It's not talking about grammar as a language art. Notice how it talks about grammar as the study of facts about the world. It's not even talking about grammar as an art. Listen to that real quick. About sixth grade, we are building the foundation. We are Listen teaching here. children the facts about how the world works. Children in this age group are naturally curious and easily absorb information and truths. They love to sing and chant and mimic. And so the classical model teaches children to memorize fundamentals in a way that is natural and engaging to them. Notice it's, it said nothing about language. It said nothing about learning the art of language. It's about learning information. It's just about memorizing uh, facts about the world, chanting and singing songs. It has nothing to actually do with the art of grammar, which is what the trivium is concerned with. Grammar, reasoning, and rhetoric, or grammar, logic, and rhetoric, these are, these are the arts of language and thinking. 
They're arts to be learned and practiced. Grammar here is just elementary school learning facts, chants, fundamentals like you know, adding and subtraction facts, learning songs and memorizing stuff. But the problem is, what is the stuff? What is the stuff? What are these facts? This has nothing to do with grammar. This is just elementary school. It's just elementary school. So keep an eye out. We're going to move on to the next art here, or next stage of learning, which is logic. As students move towards middle school and enter the logic stage, we are building on this foundation. These preteens are interested in the why and how behind the facts of the world. They enjoy proving a point and forming opinion, so we teach them formal logic. They begin to use the fundamentals they've learned in the grammar stage to determine truth and reject false arguments. Now, we're being taught here that teenagers love truth. Teenagers love to prove things true. Teenagers love to find fallacies. I don't know about you, but I don't think that that's what teenagers do. Teenagers are going through puberty. Teenagers are as irrational and crazy as we are at any stage of our lives. It's true, I think, that teenagers like to argue. But the fact that they like to argue doesn't mean that they're interested in logic and reasoning and truth. Because they're arguing with their parents, who they're supposed to be obeying. They're actually irrational, most irrational, at this stage of their life. Notice again, there's no talk of the actual art of reasoning or what the source would be. We just go from learning about information in the grammar stage to now learning how to reason, learning how to discern truth from error and identify fallacies in this next natural stage of development. There's no, there's no evidence for this, no appeals back to sources from, remember all those names, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, there's, why refer, why refer to authoritative sources and then never show that what you're saying is found in those sources? It's just a mirage. This has nothing to do with any historic education. Let's go through that again. They begin to use the fundamentals they've learned in the grammar stage to determine truth and reject false arguments. The final stage in classical education is the High rhetoric school? stage. The word rhetoric, originally from the Greek rhetor, is defined by Merriam-Webster as the art of speaking or writing effectively. In high school, the classically trained student is armed with facts about the world, and they have learned how to use these facts to determine truth and reject falsehoods. Now these claims are, are pretty audacious, right? You know, one of the things I think is funny is that, again, after appealing to Aristotle as an authority in a previous scene, and giving us the Greek origin of the word rhetoric, we then go for a definition of the term to Merriam-Webster. You know, why not go to Aristotle? Why not give Aristotle's definition of rhetoric? Because it wouldn't work in this video, that's why. Um, to sit there and say that this system of education, listen to how confidently they talk about the effectiveness of this system. Listen about how they tell you how the student does this, and does this, and does this. And then the student um, learns, to, learns to seek the truth and defend the truth. Aren't we going a little far here? This educational system does not make children saints. It does not cause a, children, a child to believe. Listen to that again, the description of this rhetoric phase. It's pretty impressive when you hear the claims of what is accomplished in these children's lives if they study this rhetoric program. Listen to this. By Merriam-Webster as the art of speaking or writing effectively. In high school, the classically trained student is armed with facts about the world, and they have learned how to use these facts to determine truth and reject falsehoods. Students are now ready to communicate these truths in eloquent and persuasive arguments. As the classical student completes the K through 12 education, they enter into the next season of life with the ability to defend their hearts and minds from error and to share the truth effectively. You realize the claims that this makes? If your children 
go through this educational system. Listen to that again. Listen to the claims they make. There's no reference to grace. There's no reference to dependence on God's grace or cooperation of the will of the student. Listen to these claims. Listen to what this video is telling parents they will receive if they get on board with this model of education. Listen to this. Well, education, they enter into the next season of life with the ability to defend their hearts and minds from error and to share the truth That's effectively. Bold claim. We've all heard the old adage that if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. We can treat education simply as a means of transferring information, with the teacher as the wealth pot of knowledge and the student as an empty vessel to be poured into. But as creatures made... Notice here, this is an important theme in this, this fake classical education. Notice how they want to encourage parents to not look for teachers who are experts. Notice how they talk about teachers who simply dispense knowledge to their students as being not the right way. This is not the classical way of education. Listen to that again, because this is important. Simply as a means of transferring information, with the teacher as the wealth pot of knowledge and the student as an empty vessel to be poured into. But as creatures made in the image of God, students are not simply a mind to be filled and emptied again. So now that sounds innocent. And most Christians would listen to that and say, yeah, that's right. But that's actually wrong. What this fake classical education movement can't do is actually provide those teachers. Do you think that St. Thomas Aquinas was like a pitcher full of ideas that dispensed those ideas to his students? Absolutely. That's exactly what St. Thomas was. That's exactly what a real master teacher is. A master teacher has the arts mastered himself. A master teacher has already completed the studies. A master teacher can tell the students how to study the arts. He can help the student master the arts because he himself has mastered them. You'll see that in this fake classical education movement, there's always an attempt to separate from that idea of a teacher who's an expert because these schools and these programs, they don't have those teachers. So if you're going to send your child to you know, classical Christian school, you're going to have some 28-year-old guy with a bachelor's degree in English who's teaching your kid Latin. And you're going to wonder, is this guy who never actually studied Latin actually capable of teaching my kids Latin? And you're going to be told, well, you know, education's not about just dispensing knowledge of an art to children. It's much more, it's much more complicated than that. It requires the, the nurturing of the whole child. Well, all of this is, is an excuse to get around the fact that the guy teaching the Latin class never studied Latin before. The, the guy teaching the upper school philosophy class, you know, 10 years ago was working as an electrician, and he's a, he's a good intention guy who's, you know, on the school board. You're going to see these schools always try to explain away why the teachers that are working in their schools have no background in these studies. They're not experts in these studies. They're not real schoolmasters. They they, they're not able to stand in front of a class of students and tell the students the truth about a topic. And yet, after criticizing that model, if we go back into the history why are we talking about Aristotle? Why are we talking about Plato? How did Aristotle teach? Was he like a container that dispensed knowledge to his students? Of course he was. How did Thomas Aquinas teach? Was he like a container filled with wisdom that dispensed that wisdom to the students who were treated like cups sitting at their desks? Of course he did. 
He was the master. They were the students. He taught them the arts and sciences. They sat and listened and took notes and memorized the things he taught. He dispensed the wisdom because he was actually the master. That's exactly how education worked in history. That's why students need teachers. That's why they needed teachers. And when the printing press came out, and all of a sudden the teacher could set his, set his teachings into a book, and that book can be mass-produced, all of a sudden education changed because the content was no longer locked up in the mind and heart of the teacher. It was available in a book that the teacher wrote for students. And when the internet was developed, what was in the book was able to be put on the internet and can be accessed freely. The content is exactly what education is, and the sources that we study are the whole point of classical education. So to sit there and appeal to the authority of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and then turn around and talk about how teachers should not be like a pitcher full that's poured into the cups, well then what are we talking about with Aristotle and Plato? That's what they did. And you say, oh, well, Plato used the Socratic. No, he didn't. Plato presented his dialogue through, you know, in dialogue form, but that wasn't a real dialogue. He wrote that dialogue. He just leads the reader through the instruction by means of a dialogue. He wasn't actually sitting there writing sincere questions or copying something Socrates was saying. And as for Socrates, we have no idea what he taught because he never wrote anything or left us any records. So appealing to the authorities and then mocking the idea of a master teacher who dispenses knowledge to students is simply a cover for the fact that if we look, these homeschool programs, these schools will have this whole faculty of people getting paid by these poor parents, none of whom are experts in their fields, none of whom can dispense the arts and sciences as masters to their students. And that's why we have to separate ourselves from this silly idea that students are like cups to be filled up with learning from master teachers. Of course they are. That's why we're paying for teachers. And if we don't have teachers like that, there's no point paying them at all because we have books to study from. But anyway, I wanted to make sure you see how they, how they mock what was actually traditional teaching. Masters revealing the principles of the sciences and arts to students. Doesn't work in schools where you have no masters. So we have to explain that we don't need that which for parents should be a red flag. Why am I sending money to pay some guy who's not an expert to be the teacher of my ch That makes no sense. Don't fall for that nonsense. It makes no sense why you would pay for someone who never studied Latin to teach your kids Latin or who never studied math formally, never proved himself to be a master in mathematics to teach your children to decide what they study and how they study it in that's nuts, but it's common in classical Christian schools. We'll talk about that more later. Children are whole beings whole with beings. minds to be trained and All souls to be formed. Beings. So, the classical Christian teacher acts in loco parentis in the role of the parent to train the soul. In practical terms, this looks like teaching the student to recognize and love the true, good, and beautiful. Okay, so here we have another one of these, these, uh, sound bites, truth, goodness, and beauty. But I want to back up a little and, and talk about this image of the teacher that they give here. Notice what they say. Teaching is not about filling a vessel. Teaching is about forming the whole child. Listen to this. But as creatures made in the image of God, students are not simply a mind to be filled and emptied again. Children are whole beings with minds to be trained and souls to be formed. Okay, minds to be trained 
souls to be formed, children are created in the image of God. All of that is vague. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means to have a soul that has understanding, that will never die. Because the soul has reasoning, it needs to be exercised and trained in the art of reasoning. That art is taught by a master teacher by means of formal instruction. We have Aristotle's organon as the source of that art. Because this child here in the screen needs to have his soul formed, how is the soul formed? We get to the next slide and find out that the soul is formed by a teacher in a school? That's really what the Christian faith teaches us. It teaches us that souls are formed by the teacher in a school, and it tells us that the teacher is acting what? In loco parentis, in the place of a parent? So, Listen. the classical Christian teacher acts in loco parentis, in the role of the parent to train the soul. The teacher acts in loco parentis, in the place of a teacher, to train the soul. And this is what Aristotle and Plato taught? No, this is not what Aristotle and Plato taught. Parents have their own role forming the mind and soul of their children. The school is a place for academic instruction. School is for academic instruction. School is for systematic, objective, academic instruction, where teachers teach the arts and sciences to students and parents pay tuition for that instruction. What we see here is mocking that idea. Teachers aren't just sources of academic instruction. Actually, teachers act in place of a parent to form the whole child. This is modern education. This is Deweyan education. Let's move the kids away from the family and give them, what, an education in the place of a parent? Why? Why have an education in place of a parent? You're watching this video right now in your home on a computer. Why would you need me to take your place in the life of your children? That's what homeschooling is about. This is the 21st century. We have the internet in our homes. You have the works of Aristotle, Plato, not that you need them, but they're there, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Cicero, sacred scripture, the church fathers, the catechism of the church. You have direct access to all of these things in your home. Why do you need Nancy Johnson here to stand in loco parentis and try to form your whole child. You don't even need that because you have the academic content in your home where the parents are. There's no need for this modern model of the teacher as the surrogate mother who stands in the place of mom. We don't need this education anymore. This is the whole point of homeschooling. We don't need the school to replace the family. We don't need the teacher to replace mom. Mom can be mom. And the academic content can be accessed at home by mom with the children. If an expert is needed to explain the academic content or to help the child understand the academic content, those experts are available at home. You can have a tutor work with a child. There's no need for this fake modern school teacher who's actually not a teacher. We just got done saying that we, don't, we shouldn't think of teachers as teachers. We don't need a teacher to pretend she's mommy, to feed our kids, to form their souls, whatever that means. This model of education is what's wrong with modern education. Just because you throw in a Latin phrase, in loco parentis, it's jibber jabber. We don't need a teacher to be in the place of mom. Mom has access to the same resources in the living room that this teacher here, and I always refer to these modern teachers as Nancy Johnson, it's sort of a joke in my family, 
But we don't need this lady here with her, with her teaching outfit on as a professional teacher. We don't need this person anymore. She's not a master. She's not actually a teacher of arts and sciences. She's presented to us as a daycare worker who, who takes mom's place in the spiritual formation of these children. Classical education never had this. There was never this, this person in place of mom or even of dad in classical education. There was dad and there was mom and there was the teacher. That's it. The teacher was responsible for academic instruction. That's it. He wasn't, he wasn't called in to be dad. He, he, didn't, he wasn't needed to stand in the place of mom. He was there to help the child learn the arts and sciences. And then he left. That was his job. The child already has a mother and a father. We don't need this nonsense daycare worker collecting tuition to just tell the kids how to be Christians. School is for formal, systematic, academic instruction. That's what it's for. As a parent, that's what you should be paying for. You should be paying for your child to have access to systematic academic content. And if you're paying a person, you should be paying a person who you trust has that content mastered and can help your child master that content. You don't need to hire somebody to replace you as mommy. You don't need to hire somebody to replace you as daddy. You need a teacher who dispenses knowledge of the arts and sciences to your children. That's what teachers are. Don't fall for this school nonsense about the in loco parentis teacher. That was necessary. That model was important in the 1920s, in the 1950s, in the 1990s, because we had compulsory education laws. Kids had to go to school. There was no internet. There were no resources at home. All the resources were at school, and parents had to send their kids to school. In 2022, this is not necessary anymore. All the resources that the school has are available at home. You don't need anyone to stand in loco parentis anymore. That's the point of homeschooling. Let's keep going. In practical terms, this looks like teaching the student to recognize and love the true good and beautiful in this world. I want to comment on this a minute. I, I stopped here before and then went back. This phrase, the true, the good, and the beautiful, I don't know if I can catch it. There we go. Truth, goodness, and beauty. That sounds so nice, and you'll see this used as a, a soundbite in all of this classical Christian stuff. Truth, goodness, and beauty. What do we seek in classical Christian school? We seek to lead children to know truth, goodness, and beauty. That's, doesn't that sound so great? This is just gibberish. Truth is objective. So ultimately, we're going to have to answer the question, what is the truth? Like Pontius Pilate asked, what is the truth? The truth, if we take the Dominican order, the, the motto is veritas, the truth. What is the truth? The truth is God's revelation as it's found in the person of Jesus Christ who established the Catholic Church and gave us the seven sacraments, who taught us how to pray and gave us a church with a pope and bishops who would be protected by the Holy Spirit to truly interpret divine revelation for us for all time. So truth is ultimately a matter of the Catholic faith. We seek the truth in and through the Catholic Church. So this, this vague idea of truth, this is 2022. This isn't 400 BC. Revelation is finished with Jesus Christ. There's no more revelation. We're not all lost, groping about trying to find the truth. We know the truth. The truth is in the Catholic Church. When we talk about goodness, this is the subject of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, studied in moral philosophy. 
goodness is actually a very complicated topic. It's not very simple. What's good for one person is not necessarily what's good for other. And yet we'll hear, when we, when we listen to this video and, and others like it, we'll hear them constantly talking about absolute truth, absolute truth. Well, philosophy wouldn't be necessary if there was all this absolute truth around. The problem in, in life and in, in real morality is that the truth of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, isn't always absolute. That's what actually makes it difficult and why we need to study moral philosophy. But we'll find that truth usually just means you agree with their religious principles or their political platform. Goodness means you don't commit the sins that they, are, that they find to be particularly scandalous. And then beauty, we'll see, refers to not, not the kind of things that monks and saints talk about, as beautiful, like Jesus told us to set our thoughts in heaven, to, to, to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. That's what's beautiful. What's beautiful is heaven, God, the angels, the saints, eternal life. That's beauty. But what we'll see is that beauty in this, in this fake classical education system, beauty is always uh, an insincere admiration for high society. It's about fine foods. It's about fancy buildings and architecture. It's about artworks, you know, collector's art and museum pieces. That's not what beauty is philosophically. Beauty is the beatific vision, the presence of God. That's beauty. In the Middle Ages, when we talked about truth, goodness, and beauty, what we were talking about was the contemplative life, the life that's lived here in anticipation of the life in the world to come. This, however, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a number of videos again and again, this is going to be found to just be a rallying cry for whatever the political platform is, whatever you know, the moral focus is of a certain group of people, like let's say the pro-life movement, that will be defined as goodness. Um, and then beauty is going to be all of this materialistic stuff, high society. And what's ridiculous about it is that the people working in these schools, the teachers employed by these schools, they're not high society people. They're not high society people. I'm a lay Dominican. St. Dominic was poor. This, this high society, this desire to try to look like we're wealthy, elite people with with the finer things in life and call that beauty contradicts the whole point of philosophical beauty, which is contemplation. So you're going to see this, uh, this sound bite, these, again, three words just taken out of context from medieval thought and culture and smashed into this modern educational idea as a justification to pursue things that aren't necessarily pursued in the public school. The public school has to deal with every kid who's brought in off the street. They don't get to pick the handsome kids. They don't get to pick the rich kids. They don't have wine and cheese events. They're trying to get the kids some, some breakfast cereal in the morning, make sure everybody's got food. I remember my first grade teacher bringing clothes in for one of the girls in my class. It's not high society. So is this private school advertising itself as a way for parents to you know, give their children higher society? If so, is that really what Christian culture is about? Let's see what they actually have to say about truth, goodness, and beauty. In this world, from kindergarten to high school graduation, the classical student is exploring history's great and time-honored thinkers. Classrooms are orderly, welcoming, and beautiful. Much in the same way that someone learns to develop a taste for fine wine. Fine wine, I told you, this is what they do. They try to pretend like this is some kind of high society culture club. The classrooms are orderly and beautiful. We develop, uh, we develop our tastes, you know, like, like your taste for fine wine. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a taste for fine wine. I'm a poor classics teacher. We don't sit around in my house drinking expensive wines. 
when I read the rule of St. Benedict, I don't find the chapter that talks about fine wine. So this, this is sort of this fake, materialistic, wannabe high society that's, tried, that's promoted as the culture for these schools to try to draw people away from the dirty, bad public schools to this high society club. But it's, it's, a, it's just a sham. These teachers in these schools are making $30,000. It's not high society, as you'll see if you go to one of these schools. There's no high society. It's just this marketing message trying to, you know, poo-poo on the public schools with all the dirty kids and all their, you know, social justice talk and their talk about free lunch and all that yucky stuff. We cultivate the finer tastes, like, you know, like the taste of a fine wine. Give us a break. That's not what Christian education is about. Let's go. Much in the same way that someone learns to develop a taste for fine wine, mm. the classical student is trained to develop a taste for the art of Van Gogh, the music. The art of Van Gogh. That's random. You know, I've, I've seen the art of Van Gogh. I don't, I've never heard of Christians talking about the art of Van Gogh. Why in the world would we talk about the art of Van Gogh in Christian education? We're going to go on to talk about the music of Bach and other just, just randomness. It's, it's just this random culture. Why not talk about the actual art of music, which is one of the seven liberal arts? It's just this random, vague references to this, you know, snobbish high society, which, you know, these schools have nothing to do with, if we're honest, unless they're charging $50,000 a year for tuition which, you know, sort of undermines the whole purpose. But let's back up a little bit. Notice how they try to promote this, this fake high society, just random uh, references to art and music. The classical student is trained to develop a taste for the art of Van Gogh, the music of Bach, and the writings of Plato. Most importantly, a classical Christian education is rooted in God and the gospel as found in his word, since it's only in Christ that a heart is truly changed to love good. True. To be sure, most modern education systems are concerned with the character of the students they are producing. Students are taught to be good fellow citizens and to follow their hearts and dreams. At first, this may sound admirable, but the scriptures paint a different picture of the heart-led life. Now, just notice the... Just notice the, the contradiction here. In the last scene, we're talking about tasting fine wine, the art of Van Gogh, the music of Bach, and so on. Now we're being taught that what's wrong about the modern schools is that they teach children to follow your heart and they promote worldly wisdom. Well, wh well what would that worldly wisdom be? You mean like wanting to be wealthy and live a luxurious life, drinking fine wine and collecting modern artwork? They can never get the cultural message figured out because they're not interested in real Christian culture. They're not interested in real, let's say, monastic culture. They're not interested in real contemplative life. They're going to praise this sort of materialistic life in one scene and then criticize the public school or any other school because they just, they just, encourage kids to pursue career ambitions, to pursue pl pleasure. You just got done talking about the beauty of pleasant material things. Now all of a sudden the public school is bad because they promote professional discussions and they tell kids to follow their ambitions in the world. This fake classical movement can never figure out the cultural message because they really don't understand real contemplative Catholic life. They, they think that high society, being wise and cultured, means drinking expensive wine, or going to a museum, or listening to a music concert. That's just worldliness. Real happiness, real goodness, is in the contemplative life. That's what Aristotle actually teaches goodness is. It's contemplation. It's wisdom itself. So we see this effort to try to be, you know, uppity class at one minute and then turn around and pretend we're against educating kids to go make money in the world in the next minute. 
but they don't really understand what the goal is because they don't understand contemplative life, which is the real end of classical Catholic education. God's Word tells us that our hearts are deceitful and desperately sick, and that wisdom is not the natural fruit of the human heart. In classical Christian education, students are led to walk in truth and righteousness. They learn the absolute truth about God absolute and self truth. through His Holy Scripture and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Students are shaped by the ancient virtues. Educators are concerned... Now look here, what in the world are the ancient virtues? They list four virtues here on this bulletin board. They refer to them as the ancient virtues, but humility, prudence, kindness, and courage aren't even the classical virtues. The classical virtues are prudence, courage, self-control. Now that doesn't fit in with the, the whole wine scene, so we'll leave that out. Um, and justice. Well, you're not going to be attracted to justice when you're basically lying about the history of education. So we have humility, prudence, kindness, and courage. And these are referred to as the ancient virtues. Do you see how it's just, it's just all randomness? You know, if you're going to list the virtues, why not list the four classical virtues? Because they really don't fit into this system of education. That's really not what this is about. It really isn't going to lead kids to the real classical virtues. What about faith, hope, and charity, which are the means by which we actually worship God? Faith, hope, and charity, the theological virtues. No, it's just this randomness, four randomly picked virtues, but they're labeled as the ancient virtues. It's just always this randomness. I never understand how they pick and choose things, because if they knew classical philosophy, no one would pick those four virtues to put on a sign and refer to as ancient virtue. Humility, prudence, kindness, and courage. It's just random Protestantish stuff. Not only with the academic growth of students, but with the spiritual and character growth of our future leaders. And there we have a brief overview of the classical Christian education, from the trivium to virtue to recognizing the true good and the beautiful. If you'd like to read more about classical education, we'd highly recommend An Introduction to Classical Don't Education to by Christopher Perrin. Get this we'd love to provide you with a copy of the book and answer any questions you might have. Please reach out to us by visiting our website or finding our contact info in the description box below. Okay, so we'll stop there and... Uh... There we have this introduction to uh, what is classical Catholic or classical Christian education. Um, you know, as I watch, as I go through that again, you know, I know people will disagree with me on this, but I don't think it's innocent. I don't think this is innocent ever to make a historical claim without any evidence. That, that's just, that's sophistry. You know, why would you appeal to history? Why would you appeal to Aristotle or Plato and then not provide any evidence from Aristotle or Plato? Why would you appeal to Greece and Rome and then bring no evidence from Greece or Rome? I don't think that that's innocent. I think it's sophistry. I think it's misleading. I think it's false advertising. And I think a lot of people fall for this stuff because they see grammar, logic, rhetoric. They're interested in you know sounding different, trying to appear different from other people. It gets the Starbuck effect going in the little school community. Um, but it's not true. This is not the ancient model. This was never taught in ancient Greece or Rome. This was never taught in Christian history. So all the talk about the Bible and uh, learning to have your heart formed by God, this way was never the way by which that was done at any time in Christian history. Um, there's no mention of the church, no mention of the sacraments. Um, it's just making up Christianity as much as it's making up classical education. And then you just throw truth, good, and beauty on there. You know, that uh, true goodness, and, uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. Throw that in there. That spruces things up a little bit. And that's your answer. What is classical Christian education? Um, watching that video, I would have no idea what classical Christian education is. There's no mention of a book or a source or a subject, no 
details about what we actually study, all this vague talk about, you know, goodness, happiness, humility, loviness, niceness. That's not classical, uh, classical education. And then to make the teacher as a representative who stands in the place of the parents, it just makes no sense in the 21st century. We don't need schools like this. We don't need programs like this. Mom and dad have access to expert tutors and all of the resources they need, all of the authoritative sources. If you ask me what classical Christian education is, I'll tell you explicitly. Go on the Classical Liberal Arts Academy website and go to Getting Started and click on the curriculum link and read. That's what classical Christian education is. Specific books, specific subjects, specific topics, and the kids just study the content of those works. That's what classical education is. What's my job? I'm a tutor. I've studied the works. You'll see that if you, if you um, watch my videos or read my articles. I'm the one who restored the whole curriculum. And if you would like someone to help you with your children by helping them with the explicit academic content, not to play in loco parentis in any of this modern school social engineering nonsense, but if you just want someone to help your kid learn Latin or reasoning or philosophy, that's what a tutor is for. And that's the only thing that any parents should be paying for in 2022. So I hope that's a helpful walk through this video. Um, you can see just the unfounded claims, the misleading message, the randomness of it all, the vagueness, the, the image of the teacher that's presented, not as an expert, not as an expert, but just as some friendly person who acts like mommy and daddy in the classroom. That's not what classical education ever was. We all know that. You know that. You know that Aristotle never presented himself as a person in loco parentis, you know, to help... He's an academic instructor because the classical liberal arts actually form the soul. We don't have to create this artificial division and say, oh, well, academics, that doesn't help us spiritually. No, your fake curriculum may not help kids spiritually, but the true classical Catholic curriculum will help children intellectually, spiritually, morally, and so on. So there's none of this fake division separating the church from academics or anything like that. Anyway, I think you can see watching that video um, that my claims that they do make the claim that this is the historical system of education that was used by people like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates is stated explicitly in their videos. I don't make, I'm not making that up. They most certainly have told parents that this is the ancient system of education. That if we could go back in time and travel back to Greece and Rome, we would find these ideas being taught in the schools. That the, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric are stages of learning. That we, we don't need teachers who are experts in, in dispensing mastery of the arts and sciences to children. We just need someone who has a good heart and stands in the place of a parent. You would never find that in any school anywhere in the ancient world. But that's what's presented to unknowing parents and parents not knowing any better and trusting these people embrace this and simply trust it and then worst of all, they invest in it. Thinking, sadly, thinking that this money that they're pouring into this is an investment in something timeless and trustworthy and proven, and it's not. So that's what I find unfortunate. That's what makes me angry about this advertising. I think it's, it's dishonest, it's misleading, it's unjust. They provide historical claims with no evidence, and we just shouldn't do that. It's not, it's, it's not how Christians uh, reason through things or prove things. 
So I hope that's helpful. I don't want to go on any longer, but uh, that's our first walk through one of these videos. We'll do this every once in a while when I get some time, and we'll, we'll see the kinds of things that these folks actually say, and you'll see that I'm not making these things up. They do, in fact, make these false claims explicitly to parents in their videos. We don't do that in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and if we do make a historical claim, you better believe that there will be historical evidence to support it. I hope that's helpful. God bless.